Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Victor Manash. Good morning, Victor. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, Whitney. Great to be here. Great to have you. I was just telling Victor before we got started, I can't believe he hadn't been a guest already. We've spoken at different conferences together and I've met him in person a few times and, and actually uh, have his book right here as well. So awesome. I, I, we're going to talk about that, I'm sure. And, and I hope that you will pick it up. Magnetic Capital, uh, how to raise all the money you need for any worthy venture. Uh, he is definitely an expert at that. But a little about him. He's a developer based in Ottawa, Canada, uh, and he has development projects across multiple markets in the U.S. and Canada. Canada. Uh, he's a host of the Daily uh, Real Estate Espresso podcast. Uh, congratulations to you also, Victor. There's not, I don't know of many daily podcasts, and I definitely understand the, the work behind it. Uh, but obviously, the author of the book I just told you about, and a frequent guest and speaker on uh, capital management and investing. So, uh, Victor, again, welcome to the show. You're definitely an expert in this space, and we're, we're pleasure or, or grateful to have you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, so, let's jump right in. Maybe give us an update, though, or, or what your focus is currently you know, in the real estate syndication business, uh, and let's jump in. Well, thank, thanks, Whitney. It's great to be here. These days, you, know, you have to adapt a little bit to the market conditions. You know, if you go back a decade ago, you could buy things far below construction cost. It didn't make sense to build. And so, of course, nobody did. Uh, today, the conditions are almost the opposite. There's so much money chasing so few opportunities that if a large multifamily project appears on the market, it's guaranteed there's going to be multiple offers. And if you're the winning bidder with 19 or 20 other bids behind you, you're almost guaranteed to have paid too much. So it is an auction environment out there. I was um, attending a a talk last night with the chief economist from Stewart Title Company, and he was sharing some statistics about the rate of sales for multifamily apartment complexes nationwide, uh, and as well as in a number of uh, specific Texas communities. And Q4 of last year was a record quarter for sales of multifamily product. No, At no time in history were there as many sales in multifamily as there were last quarter. So the market is absolutely hot. There's no question about it. So how do you get out of that auction environment? And what what is the right product to, to bring to market so that you're satisfying the, the demand, uh, it, the market's not getting oversupplied, uh, all of these fundamentals have to be in play. And uh, so that's what we focus on. So today, we're probably 90, 95% new construction, uh, whereas years ago, we weren't. Uh, but that's been the shift. I appreciate you elaborating on that. And and uh, that's it's great to think about, and just even having those conversations with people like you're talking about, so you can better understand what's happening right now, and being able to adapt to to market conditions. I just think that's very wise, uh, and not just sticking in your box, right? You think this is your box over here, and never never looking outside that box and being willing to change. Uh, but you know, you mentioned you know, just the auction environment, I'm sure the listener, you know, is thinking, okay, wait a minute, you know, the auction environment makes so much sense to call it that. How do you get, how do we get out of that? Well, when something goes up on the MLS, or maybe even if it's an off-market deal, chances are enough people have seen it that it's going to end up being a multiple bid type situation. You know, from everyone who's in this business knows from experience that if there's a sole bidder, you've got much more negotiating leverage than if there's 20. That just makes just makes sense. So how do you get yourself in an environment where the, where you're the sole bidder? The nice thing about doing new construction and new development is that there's nobody competing with the idea that's only in your own mind. That's strictly yours. So you're immediately out, of, you're not deal finding, you're, you're manufacturing the deal out of an idea, out of a concept. And so there's no competition for that, or at least very little competition. If you're, so I, 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 the distinction I make is what's the difference between finding deals versus creating deals? If I can create deals at will, simply by saying, okay, now it's time to get another deal in the pipeline, Where's where can we find, are there an infill project or raw land that meets the numbers uh, where there's the demand and all the numbers work, 
then you go launch that project and you basically create your business at will rather than being necessarily victim to the vagaries of the market. I think it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting thought. They just the uh, obviously, like you said, it makes sense if there's if there's one bidder compared to if there's twenty. Oh, well, obviously, the price is going to go up if you got twenty buyers, right? Uh, and you do see that for most deals now. Anything that's even remotely close to making sense, uh, and usually by the time it's done, it's not going to make much sense, right? Uh, but being a developer, I can see how you know thinking through. It's your uh, creativity, right? It's your thought process that, that's making this deal. Uh, and, and there's not other competition for the same idea, I guess. Is that accurate? That, that, that's exactly right. And you now have the opportunity to be a community builder. You have the opportunity to design product for which there is pent up demand. I'll give you a simple example. Years ago, we were developing in Philadelphia uh, in the shadow of Temple University. And what we found was there was a surplus. We discovered this by accident. We found there was a surplus of three and four bedroom units within the shadow of Temple University. And the, w- the way we found that out is there was a lady who wanted to rent a, a three bedroom unit in one of our triplex buildings close to Temple. Uh, and it was just for herself. We said, why is that? She said, well, I can't find a one or two bedroom. And it was like, oh, the light went off. Okay, we need to pay attention here. So fo- we did more research and following that, we only did ones and twos because there was a mismatch in in between supply and demand for that product. Even though if you just look at vacancy rate in the market or just look at some of the macro numbers, you would come to the conclusion that, you you, well, you might come to a different conclusion, but we saw a, a, a shortage of that one and two bedroom product close to the university, presumably for graduate students because they don't want necessarily the frat house experience. Uh, and And that's what we built after that. We didn't do any threes and fours after that. Nice. Well, you know, speak to, I know you have this thing you call like a buy on the line or move the line strategy and, mm-hmm. and playing, uh, you know, or at a smaller scale, but at the big developer game. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Yeah, this is a strategy that we started in Philadelphia. We've been applying it in other places as well. And it really conveys the, the notion very clearly. So what is that line? We say buy on the line, move the line. That line is on one side of the line, you've got that hot gentrified neighborhood. You've got all the local coffee shops and boutiques and art galleries. And on the other side of the line, you go two blocks too far, you're in the hood. And every city in America has that line. Wherever you're sitting, listening to this, you can visualize it. I know that. Now, if that line is arbitrary, as it often is, that line is movable. If the line is a hard boundary, if it's a municipal boundary or a school district or a freeway, it's going to be more difficult to move the line. We think about you know places like Austin, Texas. You've got I-35 cutting the city in half. Used to be that west of I-35 was the hot area. East of I-35, you didn't want to go. And then it took the University of Texas to build a baseball stadium on the east side of I-35. And then everybody said, oh, it's okay to go east east of I-35 now. Now, the east side of I-35 is a hot area. So you can find those lines and redevelop on the line. And guess what? Now the line's on the other side of your property, which means you can go do it again and again and again. Now, if you just do one or two, the marketplace might, might not take notice. But if you put a little bit of scale behind it and you do five or six, or maybe you bring some friends along, and you put a little scale behind it. Now the marketplace says, oh, the line has moved, I get it. And here's the beauty. When you buy on the wrong side of the line, you can often buy that land for pennies on the dollar compared with the hot gentrified neighborhood next door. You might not get 100 cents on the dollar in terms of rents. Maybe you'll only get 95 cents on the dollar, but if you're paying 10 cents on the dollar for the land, the numbers work. You're able to create tremendous value. And in reality, when you go to get that property appraised, there are no comps in the hood. So (laughs) where are they going to get the comps from? They're going to go a block away. You're going to get 90, 95, 98 cents worth of the value compared with the hot hot area next door. And so this has been a very successful strategy for us over the years. We continue to do it. And we, we, you know, a lot of people say, you know, if rent is 1800 bucks in the hot area, Am I willing to live a block away for 200 bucks less a month? Most people will say yes. And then a little bit over time, you'll find that those rents will normalize and you're getting basically full rent. 
That's it. What how, what do you find is the timeline for moving the line like that? It, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it it depends on the influx of population. So, you know, a lot of people think about what's a bargain, and you know, you might go into a community like say Detroit where you can buy land, infill land, very inexpensively. The problem, though, is that it's a shrinking city. You've got shrinking population. And so that's why you can buy these properties so inexpensively. So they're inexpensive, but it doesn't mean they're a bargain. On the other hand, we want to see influx of jobs. We want to see influx of population. And when you have those conditions where there's that upward pressure on demand, that's when those market conditions make sense. And so you've got to look at absorption rates. You've got to see what's bringing people into the area. It's always hyper-local, always hyper-local. You may f find a boundary where there's, uh, let's say there's a river. And you see, actually, you see this all over Florida. Uh, the, you know, for, Florida has tremendous coastline. And you go one block inland, and there's still nice houses. You go four blocks inland, and there's nothing. I mean, it's just a wasteland. You see this all over Florida. It's it's insane, uh, and so there's those th that line exists within a block of the water all over Florida. I mean, it's it's crazy how that that exists. Those market conditions exist. So you just need to be attached to those good areas, and now you can create tremendous value. Is this you know when we talk about you know buy on the line or eventually moving you know the line moves or you move the line. Uh, you know, over time, is this development, you know, specific, or would you say this could work for, you know, existing properties also? It, it can work for both. When we started, for example, again, I'll go back to Philadelphia, we were buying historic homes that were built in the 1920s. Uh, many of these houses were in terrible, terrible condition. If the structure was salvageable, we would demolish the inside, put a new building on the inside. So there's a heavy renovation. Okay. It's a it's almost new construction, but not quite. So we were able to preserve the brick facade. You know, these buildings had a lot of character. You could do exposed brick walls on the inside, which are super cool. Uh, so you could really do things that were uh, that mix of modern and historic together that just really works. You get all the features of brand new construction with the with the character of, of an older property. And uh, so we did quite a bit of that as well. And we love doing those types of projects. It's sad when you have to tear something down just because it's a little bit too far gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great to know. I just, I know your, your focus right now is development. So I just wonder where you see that uh, right now, but you know, on that same train of thought, uh, just as far as a uh, demands in our current market uh, today, or, or just, uh, you know, the state of the market, what products do you know, do you see that are in demand in your focus as far as development or even, even, uh, you know, existing product? I think there's a lot of people looking for medium density, not necessarily high density rental product or even low density rental product. Problem, problem with low density, of course, is difficult to manage. So what product can you d deliver to the marketplace that lives and feels like a single family home, whereas uh, it gives you the, the, the density and the concentration so that you can manage it effectively? Uh, what we love, frankly, are townhouse developments. Uh, because, you know, if you think about back to the 1970s, you would see a lot of fourplexes being designed where you'd get this cube of four apartments put, put together. And it felt like a multifamily type setting. But if you have a row of townhouses, executive townhouses, that lives like a single family home. Now you can put four of these together, you can call it a fourplex, or you can call it four executive townhouses. And you can sell, you could sell that block of four, say to a doctor or dentist, if you want, if you want that as an exit. And you, you can't tell by driving by, you can't, you know, people aren't going to say, oh, this is rental product. It, it, it lives like an owner occupied single family home. And so people grew up in a single family home. That's the experience that they want. They don't want to be necessarily living up on the fourth floor of a garden style apartment complex. Now some do, and that's great. And we're building plenty of those. Um, but for those that are looking for that single family home experience, you can get a much more cost-effective build in a townhouse product. You get some fantastic layouts. You get very efficient land use. Uh, a lot of things really work with that product. So we're 
you know, we're, we have a number of land development projects specifically for, for that product. Can you speak to, you know, like uh, on, a, on a small scale, right? And maybe that's what we're talking about now. You know, we're talking about fourplexes, but, but as far as somebody trying to get into the development space, you know, they hear you say, okay, 90 to 95% of your focus is on new construction right now. Yep. And they're thinking, okay, you know, I've done a few small or multifamily deals or maybe even a few large ones, but we've never been the developer, right? We've never built anything. How do you, what do you say to that individual that's, that's, you know, thinking about transitioning because they want to, they want to be, you know, in the market like you are, you know, Victor, and in, in, uh, being able to do those things, be creative. What do you say to them when they're thinking about making that transition? I think the key is to get people in your team that have experience. Uh, and I mean, contractors and GCs in particular fall into a couple of different categories. Uh, at the one end of the spectrum, you've got the two guys in a pickup truck. And, those are the ones you don't want to work with. And there's some good ones at that level, but for the most part, you don't want to work with those. You want to work with the ones that are used to building larger projects. They've got systems. They're much more professional. And you obviously have to get re uh, referrals to find out the character of those businesses. Some of them will low bid and change order you to death. But then there's others still that are just a machine. They are a development machine and they deliver high quality product at a good price. They're just experts at what they do. And if you get those guys working with you, to some extent, they will lead the way because they're not going to change their systems and processes for you. If they're doing projects for HUD, you know, how to prove developments, th that's their process. They don't have multiple processes. They only have one. So they're going to manage your project the same as they would for that upper echelon of the industry. Get people in your team that can help you do that, execute those projects. And it's going to give you better cost per square foot in terms of construction. It's going to give you better execution. It's going to give you uh, access to better subtrades. Um, all of the things just seem to work better. And one of the biggest mistakes that I see rookies make is by trying to start too small. Because when things are too small, you don't have the, the revenue, you don't have the, the profit to afford all of the skills that you need to have a, a fully built out team with all the skills. So, you know, simple example, you know, if I'm building, let's say, a 250 unit apartment complex, as compared with, say, a triplex, the effort from my standpoint is kind of the same. It's really, you know, if, as, a, as an investment manager, the effort is almost exactly the same. But for that 250-unit complex, there's a developer fee there that can pay for skills that you can hire. You can hire consultants and bring them into your team. So now you're playing with a full deck of cards as opposed to just, you know, ho hoping that, that, you know, that, that jack of spades, is that's your only card in your deck. And so hoping that's going to be good enough. Your team is extremely important, right? And I think it's neat that you talk about like doing a deal too small is often a problem. Uh, and it's such a mental block, I find, you know, with most people, right? It's, you feel like you just have to start small. It's just this assumed transition to larger deals. Uh, but how can someone add value to someone like that that's experienced in uh, an experienced developer when they're trying to, uh, you know, partner with them, I guess, to gain, to have that experience on their team to get started? The challenge, okay, so we, we often get, for example, people volunteering saying, can I just intern in your business and learn that way? And that rarely works out. But when it does work, here are the conditions that where it does work. The person, we're running a business. This is not a, a hobby or anything like that. When we need something done, it's, you know, a real deliverable with real deadlines that have to be met. So, if you're going to volunteer in a business, you got to make sure that that's a priority. They're not getting the leftovers. If they're just getting the leftovers, they're not going to count on you. And then you're basically going to get sidelined within weeks. But if you really want to get into the center of the action, then you have to be willing to commit the time and the effort. They'll pay you, by the way, if they can. Uh, we have, you know, for example, we have someone within our team who is transitioning out of the military. So... As part of his military transition, he has the government paying for his salary for a year for that on-the-job training. So his his salary is being paid for by the government. He's doing amazing work. I know we're going to hire him when when we're done or when he's done with the military or they're done with him. 
because it's such a great thing. And he's getting something fantastic out of it. His He's on a steep learning curve. He's contributing in a meaningful way to the business. Uh, he's delivering real value and it works. And we've had other folks where we give them a deliverable and then three weeks later, where is it? Uh, well, I got busy. Okay, well. How bad do you want to intern, right? How exactly. bad do you want to learn in this business? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, Victor, pivoting just a little bit, uh, you know, and obviously with what's happened over the past year or so, you know, how are you uh, personally, how do you like to prepare for a downturn? You know, looking at new deals, what are some just non-negotiable things for you? We haven't changed our standards at all. Uh, if I think about the way we're underwriting deals, it's frankly not very different from the way it was back in 2013, 2014. The market ran up and we saw that it actually got a whole lot harder to meet our criteria. So we actually slowed down in 20, you know, 2018, 2019 because it was just getting too difficult to find or even create those opportunities. Today, we're, we're busier than ever. We're busier than ever because there, are, there is product coming to the market. There are opportunities coming to the market. There are demographic shifts that COVID-19 has accelerated. Now, thankfully, we're not in office. We're not in retail, at least not very much. So we, we don't have some of those exposures. We're able to play offense in this market where a lot of people are playing defense. And so that that's a, a nice position to be in. You know, think about it. We have a baby boomer transition happening with 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day. 75% of those boomer owned businesses have no succession plan. One in 13 of those businesses will shut down without a buyer because they have no succession plan. So how would you like to be in an environment where there's 13 sellers for every one buyer? That's the reverse auction. You have a lot of leverage if you're the one buyer at that table. We're, we're buying a business. We're in the middle of negotiating a business right now that it's not a huge business. It does you know, a little over a half million a year and maybe 150 grand in cash flow. We'll buy that business for about 1.3 years of earnings. I mean, you're almost buying them with their own money. And those wow. types of opportunities wow. are all over the place. What kind of businesses are you focusing on there? If we're, you know, okay, maybe we should consider buying, buying a business. You know, the beauty of buying a business is that it's already a proven business with revenue and customers and, and all the rest. Now, the key, of course, is to make sure that when you extricate the owner from the business, that there's still a business left. So my definition of a business, as opposed to someone who simply purchased a job, is one where you can remove the owner and it continues to run itself. So, you know, do they have a staff? Do they have employees? If you take the owner out and maybe replace them with a, a salaried general manager, it, does, does it still function? So that that's what we look for. Uh, we, you know, whether it's a service business or uh, it could be a manufacturing business, all types of these businesses. Um, you know, there's there's businesses out there that have been run in a very old school way. Uh, I talk with people all the time about this. I was speaking with someone uh, just last week about a manufacturing business and he's leaving money, you know, the seller is leaving money on the table because he didn't want to do deliveries. He just wanted to do manufacturing, but no, don't, sorry, don't do delivery. So he was turning business away. So you can buy that business for what it's doing right now, add the delivery component, and now all of a sudden you've grown the business by adding a component that was so simple. Hmm. Um, you know, there's just so many opportunities out there like that, of businesses that have been sunset, in their sunset for years, and they haven't been invested in the proper way. Hmm. Victor, what do you predict to happen over the next six to 12 months in the real estate market? Well, I wish I had a, a crystal ball on this one. And I'm, believe me, I'm looking, I'm peering deeply in the crystal ball. There's headwinds and tailwinds. And the, the net sum of that is to figure out which is bigger, the headwind or the tailwind in any particular instance. There's no question that office is forever changed. That's, that's clear. We think about you know major law firms, accounting firms, uh, they're shrinking their footprints. You know, you have companies like EXP Realty, a real estate brokerage that owns no real estate. I mean, what's up with that? 40,000 employees. I mean, if you think about the math, just do the math on 40,000 employees 
at say 200 square feet per employee. And even if you even if the real estate was free and you just paid the operating expense, maybe $13, $14 per square foot of operating expense, I mean, the savings from not having that real estate on 40,000 employees, that's like, I don't know, $150 million a year, <laughs> you know, just, just in operating costs. So what if you took that $150 million a year and, and did something with it to grow the business? It's, it, it's extraordinary what you can do. Um, you know, I, I know of major law firms in Toronto that are, you know, they, they occupy four or five floors of a major office tower and with a huge floor plate, they're going to skinny down to one floor and it's all going to be conference rooms for meeting with clients. The lawyers are all working from home. That's what it's going to be going forward. So, you know, there, there, things are changing. There's no question. Uh, we see thing, We see a lot of buildings. When we look at them now, we say, wow, that, these buildings are functionally obsolete. Because you just fast forward even a couple of years. Uh, you know, for, for example, we're, we've got projects in construction right now. I kid you not, we, just this past week, we made the decision to eliminate all the cable TV wire. Made the decision to eliminate all the telephone wire from the new construction. And we're only putting in Ethernet, only Ethernet. Um, now, is that the right decision? Yeah, I think so. And we're also future-proofing it because we're going to put in conduit. So that if we have to pull fiber in the future, well, there's fiber in there too, but if we have to pull fiber in the future, we can do that. We're not ripping up drywall, having to fish wires or any of that stuff. All right, Victor, a few final questions quickly uh, before we run out of time. Uh, what are a couple of daily habits that you are disciplined about that have helped you achieve success? Probably number one uh, is producing a podcast seven days a week. <laughs> so I think there's not many of us on the planet that are on that hamster wheel. I know you're I one agree. of them. And, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's been both a, a blessing. It's been a discipline. The way that I think about it is... I imagine the National Arts Center Orchestra filled to the rafters for, with folks that have come out to listen to me for a few minutes every day. And that connection time, I mean, if, would you go to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. and have that place filled to the rafters and come in unprepared? It's unthinkable. And so that's how I visualize the podcast. Uh, and that's why we're now, what, 1,150 episodes uh, without missing a heartbeat. And, uh, so that's, you know, that's a blessing. I take time to read every day. I, I start my morning actually reading the wall street journal. Um, I make time to meet with my team. We have a stand up meeting every day with the whole team. It does not, doesn't have to be very long, but it's a tight meeting with the agenda. And we make sure that people are following up on their actions and we keep things moving. Um, could you highlight some... that agenda quickly? Sorry. Could you just highlight that agenda quickly? The agenda for the meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, literally the first few minutes, it's to, it's a 30 minute meeting. And we say, the first thing we do is we set the agenda for the meeting. We say, okay, what do we need to cover today? It, and so we, we're going to cover five or six items in that 30 minutes. And if it's going to be anything more than that, then we have to schedule a separate time for that to do a deep dive if we have to. Um, and that's, it's really that simple. Uh, we have multiple projects underway. We're making sure that the, 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 the most urgent items are being managed. Uh, we project manage using Asana. So everything is tracked that way. And it's just having that discipline uh, that makes it that makes it work. So we know what some of the critical items are coming up over the coming days and weeks. There's a lot of activity, as you can imagine, in a single project, let alone multiple projects. So we have to be on top of that and make sure that Number one, we don't run out of time. We don't run out of money. We don't run out right. of, you know, fill in the blank. I've heard different people talk about, even on the show, people I've interviewed talk about that daily stand-up meeting. And we've not implemented that. We meet numerous times to the week, but I think there's a lot of value in that, even that just that short communication, but that often, that consistent. And uh, But, you know, you wrote the book, uh, Magnetic Capital. And, and uh, so quickly, what's your best source right now for meeting new investors? We are... Uh, mostly they're warm introductions. Uh, the projects that we're doing are of a size where, um, you know, we've done a fair bit of syndication, but we're kind of doing less and less in syndication, if that makes any sense. And that's because we're attracting larger investors that have the ability to write a single check. So most of the conversations we're having right now are with family offices, 
Uh, we know family offices, and we're in discussion with family offices that are uh, looking to deploy in the tens or hundreds of millions this year, in the next 12 months. So they have to put that money to work. And so then our job is to, is to say, okay, are, we're, are we your team of choice? Where it's not just one deal, but maybe a stream of investment over a period right. of time. And what does it take for us to be that team for you to choose us and work with us on a sustained basis? So it's a win-win scenario. We have pretty much an assured stream of investment dollars. You've got a team that you can count on. Uh, now you have something that's sustainable and you're not going back to the well and drilling a new well every time you've got a new project. How do you like to give back? I love to help people with introductions. I love to teach. Um, I love to contribute to a few social causes. I've got connected with uh, a lady who is doing some amazing work uh, lately in the realm of human trafficking. So mm -hmm. there's a, uh, a project that we're working on together that uh, is super cool. We're having so much fun and uh, I think making a difference. Uh, so those are a few ways that I like to do. Well, Victor, I'm obviously grateful to know you and have you on the show uh, finally. And, and uh, But just grateful for the discussion today and talking about the importance of being able to adapt to market conditions and how you've done that and focusing on new construction uh, and getting out of that auction environment. Uh, and, and then talking through uh, buying on the line. I, I like that thought process. And at least as you're touring that market and you're driving around, you're looking at deals, thinking about, do you know where that line is? And, and, and considering, you know, can we buy on the line? Where is it at? What's hindering that process or is it being hindered? Um, so great discussion there. And just even the products uh, that are in demand today uh, and having experience on our side. So uh, Victor, thanks again. How can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Well, you can connect with me directly through my website at victorjm.com. That's victorjm.com and would love to connect with you as well through the podcast. That's the Real Estate Espresso podcast, like the Italian coffee. It's literally your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. It's a daily show, seven days a week. Weekday shows is just me, five minutes. And the weekend edition are interviews with notable people from the world of investing. So love to connect with you that way as well. And it's available on virtually every uh, podcasting platform out there. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.